Let's do some by hand calculus with polar area integrals. Uh, first, try to write the polar area integral as you remember it, or try to reason through it again. Uh, so we're starting with it equals some starting point, going to some stopping point, one half radius at theta squared d theta. Um, and uh, you could also write, if you're writing r equals some function of theta, um, you could say integral like a to b one half f of theta squared d theta. Um, we should make it clear that we're computing the function of theta first and then squaring it, not squaring the theta. Uh, let's use r equals one plus 0 0.8 sine of 12 theta. Think about what that might do before we graph it. Um, so as theta goes from, uh, so let's do um, 0 to 2 pi. So we're just going to do a full circle, but what's going to happen with this? It's going to be oscillating fairly quickly, 12 times during the whole circle, um, and then we're damping down the amplitude a little bit so it won't be going positive 1 to negative 1, it will be going negative 0.8 to positive 0.8, and then we're adding 1 to that, so it's kind of hovering around 1, going down to uh, 0.2, going up to 1.8. So let's go graph it quick. So I've got it set up in a new spreadsheet here. I've got the new formula 1 minus 0.8. Um, I guess we're using plus 0.8. And fill that down. Um, does this look like a, the nice kind of beautiful graph we're used to seeing? No, that looks kind of spiky. What do we think might be going on there? It seems like we have 12 kind of petals to a flower, um, but we only get a few points for each one. It would be better if we did a more fine-grained resolution approach to theta, and then we'd have um, more dots on each one. So instead of going by steps of 0.1, let's go by steps of 0.01. Oh, that does look a lot nice, nicer, but now we need to go farther out into theta territory. So we'll go, let's see where we are. Okay, we're almost to 2 pi. Oh, a little past 2 pi. That's close enough. And then we'll, we have to change the, so, um, we have to change what we're plotting. Of course, we have to fill this down. This is why other programming languages like Python and stuff are better because you just define a new array and then do all the calculations again um, just with one line. You don't have to remember to extend your ranges and stuff. Um, so let's, uh, oh, that's so much nicer. So now we're asking what the area of that is. Um, and I've got still the same things filled in here, so it's calculating the area, so we can get a sneak peek of the area here, so somewhere around 4. Um, but let's go back and uh, do this by hand. All right, here's surely the world's best drawing of the graph we just had. Let's do some quick lower bounds and upper bounds on the area. Um, what's the smallest possible value of the area, real quick, I think we can agree the area has got to be bigger than zero. Another, what's a better lower bound, we could draw the circle that each of those kind of petals of the flower gets down to. Um, so that would be, uh, so the, our bound is pi times a radius squared. What is that radius? It's one minus 0 0.8. How about an upper bound? We could draw a circle around the whole thing. And what's the largest value this takes on? It would be when sine is 1. So we'd have 1 plus 0 0.8 squared. And then how about a guess? Well, there's actually two reasonable ways to do the guess. You could do the lower bound plus the upper bound divided by 2. But that kind of ignores the fact that this area of the circle grows kind of... Um, in a squared fashion with the radius. Um, so another way um, would be to say what's kind of the average radius. Uh, 
and I don't mean spending a lot of time figuring out the average radius. I'm just saying the average radius here looks like it's 1 because it's you know down to, to uh, 1 minus 0 0.8 up to 1 plus uh, 1 plus 0 0.8 um, so pi times an average radius of 1 squared so I think that's a good way to do a bound too. Um, it's an interesting question can we say systematically which one of those is better for flowers shaped like this uh, maybe we'll let that be an extension problem all right let's actually do the integral so we have the integral try to write it before i write it here zero to two pi one half times the radius function which is one plus 0.8 sine of 12 theta squared um like that, d theta. Does this look like a fun integral to do? Depends on your definition of fun, I guess. Um, how about uh, u substitution? Um, we might say, well, there's something inside the integral there, right inside the squaring. So can we say 1 plus 0.8 sine 12 theta for u? But then du is going to have a cosine, and we don't have a cosine here. Um, but du will involve cosine, so that ends up being a dead end. All right. Uh, well, we don't have much other choice but to foil that out. Um, so we'll expand the stuff squared um, and let's move the one half out in front um, so we'll get one half integral 0 to 2 pi and then what happens when we square this we square the one and um, it's tempting to just square this and be done with it but remember there's that cross product term remember a plus b squared is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. Um, so I have to do 2 times one, the 1 times the 0.8 sine of 12 theta plus that term squared. d theta. Boy. Well, at least this one is just a plain old sine integral, and this one is, hmm, what do we do? That's a square of a sine. We're going to need a trig identity. This one, we uh, we could do a u substitution on it, or if we remember that shortcut rule, um, when all we have is a simple frequency, uh, and this one wouldn't be too hard, fortunately, but we can actually be clever and use geometry here. Um, what if I just had this as the integral all by itself? That would be um, our radius is 1 d theta. So we just have the unit circle. Actually, that's tempting to think of as my radius is 1 d theta and I'm going 0 to 2 pi. But another way to think of this is now that I've done the whole one half radius squared thing, um, I should think of this in ordinary x y coordinates. So you could say this is a height of one squared, a constant height of one squared from zero to two pi, um, and you would get what uh, two pi times one, which is the uh, is that the area of the unit circle? No, that's twice the area of the unit circle. So really, this this approach is better. It's not the unit circle. This one, again, let's follow up with this, thinking of it in terms of x and y now. Um, if you actually graph this function, this part, from 0 to 2 pi, it's a rapidly oscillating sine wave with a slightly different amplitude. So it just does that. And what do you think that net area is? It's spending half its time above the axis, half its time below the axis, all symmetric. Um, whew, that's handy, huh? 
Um, and then how about this one? If we graph it, that's squared, so it's going to not be going above and below the axis. It's going to do that some number of times, like 12. It's going to peak out here at 0.8 squared. And what else can we do there? We can say, well, we remember, we remember from trig identities that um, the, this is an ex exactly a cosine, and it has a center line here at a half, or a half of that peak height. Um, so that's its y value, and it's going from 0 to 2 pi. So it's not like the areas cancel positive and negative and give you zero like over here, but they cancel above and below the center line and give you just that constant center line value. So the area is one half times 0.8 squared times two pi minus zero. So I can add this area and that area and that area and then multiply them all by a half, and we should get our answer. So that's one half. This was a total area of two pi, an area of zero there, an area of one half times 0 0.8 squared times two pi. We do all that and we get 4.16-ish. And what we got on the spreadsheet was 4.14-ish, so we're doing pretty good. We're also, we can also go back and check that against our upper bound and lower bound and guess. Um, that all turns out pretty good. So I think we took a fairly complicated polar area without actually doing any antiderivatives. Isn't that interesting?